two Zieg runes. The symbol for the Schutzstaffel, the SS. It was rugged. It was aggressive. They stand for terror and oppression, for the most serious crimes against humanity. What is so fascinating about that jagged S? They had black pennants with a Zieg rune on them. I thought that was great. The runes supposedly have their origins among the Teutons, the people of the north, considered by the Nazis to be a superior race. The SS rune stands for Germanic culture, which the Nazis wanted to convey as part of their myth. But the symbol of the SS has, of all things, a Semitic origin. And those Zieg runes are still used today, for instance, in popular music, in order to cause a sensation. And with right-wing radicals. They sometimes use it in a modified form to avoid prosecution, but also present it unaltered. Today, they're used to symbolize strength. It says we're prepared to use violence. So how should Germany deal with the old runes of the SS? Is a ban the correct approach? You can ban symbols, but the conviction itself has to come about through democratic means. The Signs of Evil, the work of an impoverished graphic designer. We go on the trail of the history of a dangerous symbol. East Westphalia, the heartland of ancient Germania. It's a focus for delusions of race and native soil. The Ecksteinsteiner, 40 meters high, became a Germanic sacred site. And Hermann, the Cherusk, became a symbol of the superiority of the German race. The Wevelsburg was of special interest to the Nazis. The Renaissance structure, once a bishop's palace, simply needed the right history and SS historians obliged. The Wevelsburg was declared to supposedly have ancient Germanic heritage. Immediately after visiting for the first time, SS commander Heinrich Himmler made it the headquarters of his Black Order. The martial new nobility, as Himmler called the SS, was to have a kind of Camelot here. The SS considered itself to be the avant-garde and assumed that the majority of Germans were not mature enough. That applied to their horrible racist policies, their murderous policies, as well as to their bizarre cultic ideas. Himmler's castle was only the beginning. The village of Wevelsburg was to be moved, and the castle complex was to provide space for an SS academy, an elite school for the master race. Construction was set to start after the final victory. Himmler gradually expanded the power and size of the SS. Out of Adolf Hitler's household and security guards, Himmler created a state within a state. The SS took over control of the police and the concentration camps. Later, it unleashed the Holocaust. Himmler, who was shy and very introverted, was, if you will, the ideal head of a secret police and apparatus of repression that operated covertly. The genocide began on the Eastern Front. A memorial on the northern outskirts of Kiev commemorates one of the worst SS crimes of 1941. In the ravine at Babi Yar, 33,000 Jews were shot dead over two days. A survivor remembers. They had to lie face down on the bodies of the murdered and wait for the shots from above. Then came the next group. Jews died for 36 hours. The runes were the symbol uniting the perpetrators. They considered themselves guardians of blood purity. Ultimately, the SS would have 800,000 members. 
Sie sind mobilisiert durch Propaganda und die beinhaltet, wir stehen höher als They were mobilized by propaganda that states we are superior to the others. But for that they need someone who is unequivocally beneath them. And the anti-Semitic insanity, the world conspiracy theories, led to an explosion of violent excess. And within the framework of this dynamic, symbols like this help. Helfen solche Symbole. Graphic artist Walter Heck from the Rhineland developed the double rune in 1929. Later, he wrote, The initial designs were unsuccessful because I didn't like the soft lines of the customary S, which also did not at all correspond to the character of the Schutzstaffel. I had the idea of representing the two S's in the form of two lightning bolts and so unconsciously came upon the runes. It was the birth of the SS symbol. Heck himself was an SS first lieutenant and kept his head above water with casual labor. He got this assignment through Josef Groe, the Gau director of Southern Rhineland. Considering the later significance of the SS runes, his payment was modest, just two and a half rice marks. Walter Heck completely relinquished the rights to his design. Five years later, once Himmler had eliminated all of his rivals, the jagged lightning bolts came to signify the terror spread by the self-proclaimed Aryan elite. Victor Klemperer, a journalist from a Jewish family, closely observed the signs of that time. He wrote, Long before the Nazi SS existed, you could see their symbols in red paint on transformer sheds with a warning below. Danger, high voltage. Here, the jagged S was apparently a stylized image of a lightning bolt. Lightning, which in its energy storage and speed is such a beloved symbol of Nazism. So the SS characters could also be a pictorial expression of lightning. The SS rune has aggression in it. In the way it's designed, it stands for the lightning bolts that it transmits, but also for the Germanic, which the National Socialists wanted to convey in the form of myth. Runes were the written characters of the Germanic peoples. Starting around 200 AD, they were carved into wood or stone. They were used to inscribe objects such as coins, gifts, burial objects and memorials. Many Germanic tribes had different runes. They stood for sounds and meanings, but also for numbers, and supposedly also contained magical energy. From the point of view of the cultivated Romans, the Teutons seemed backward. The Teutons were barbarians and the ones who lacked a culture. They were the primitives who just scratched out a few things in runes. The Romans had long had a complex written language in which, like the Persians and Greeks, they wrote documents and literature. They looked down on the barbarians in the north, whom they considered to be simple savages. Today, only a few experts are truly familiar with the runic characters of the Germanic tribes. Professor Klaus Duvel from Göttingen provides an example of how the comparatively primitive writing can be interpreted. This stone says, King Sven had this stone set for Skarthi, his liegeman. It reads up here, then down, up again, then down again. And he travelled far to the west, and died here near Haithabu. Historically, all Germanic languages come from the Proto-Germanic. That's supposedly the origin of the word runo or rune, which means secret. 
Sven Kuhnucker Sati Stein Uftir Skartha Varth Tauther At Hithabu. But researchers are still unsure about the origin of runes. Of the 6,500 runic inscriptions that have been found so far, several are based on an alphabet with 24 letters. They are related to other European writing. Basically, there are four major theories that ascribe the runic writing system to one of the southern European alphabets, either Greek, Latin, Etruscan, or, and that has been investigated again in the modern era, directly to Phoenician. Whatever route runic writing took until it arrived among the peoples in the north, whether it came to the Teutons from the Etruscans, ancient Rome, or ancient Greece, its origin is most likely Phoenician. The cradle of all European written language, including Germanic runic script, lies in the Middle East, in what is today Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. A small strip along the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea. The Phoenicians were a seafaring people who influenced the world of the Mediterranean for centuries. They belonged to the family of Semitic peoples and considered themselves descendants of Abraham. Did Heinrich Himmler and his Germanic racists know all of that? Probably not, as the researchers of the 1930s still knew very little about the history of languages. So it is a cruel irony of fate that perpetrators of the Holocaust carried out their murderous campaigns while wearing insignia with Semitic roots. But for scholars today, runes remain a worthwhile subject of research. Runes are exceptional in that they have both a name and a meaning. This dual aspect of the runes, as letters and as symbols, is unique. The M rune stands for the letter M, but also for the word for person. The S rune stands for the letter S, but also for the word for son. The Teutons themselves could not explain where their graphic characters came from. They attributed magical powers to the characters and told stories about their energy and power. A few literate people feared the characters' power and changed their names. Klaus Duvel demonstrates using the example of a clothing clasp. The name of the person who made this inscription is hidden here. So that its magic would not work on him, we suspect that he altered his name. He should be called Boriso, but what's written is Buyaso. The runes have yet to reveal all of their secrets. Runeology is characterized by a number of open questions. So basically, there's a lot we don't yet know. And that leads to lay people and enthusiasts getting involved. That includes fantasists like the so-called folkish movement. Aggressively anti-Semitic, this populist movement laid the groundwork in the late 19th century for that which was to come later. Guido von Liszt was one of them. He believed in supernatural messages. During an illness, when he nearly went blind, Guido von Liszt had an inspiration, an intuition, perhaps also a vision. And he said that showed him this runic alphabet. Guido von Liszt coined the term Sieg Rune. It's a neologism by a charlatan. 
Man kann nicht völlig you can't completely das deny that we're dealing with runic forms. But he combined these runic forms and above all changed them and gave them fake names by assigning the runes designations that sounded like the real ones but were slightly changed. With Guido von Lest, terms that the Nazis end up adopting are mixed with crude ideas about Germanic culture. It's a mixture that was then turned against the supposed root of all evil, against Jews. The folkish thinkers of the 19th century undertook a racist, folkish reinterpretation of the entire runic system. The Nazis incorporated it because it fitted in very well with their so-called ideology. To that end, scholars at the University of Göttingen were brought into line. Starting in 1938, there was a dedicated institute of runology. The faculty were meant to provide proof for the belief at the core of the Nazi madness, the superiority of the Germanic race. They asserted that it wasn't the Greeks, Romans or Phoenicians who invented written language, but the Teutons. Back in 1935, Himmler had created an ancestral heritage research team to which he appointed dubious experts, more motivated by ideology than serious scholarship. Many of them were esotericists and occultists. They dug, grave robbed and reinterpreted. To them, simple ornamentation was enough to prove an ideology. And if they couldn't find the proof they wanted, sometimes they helped it along. In 1938, Himmler sent his men to the roof of the world. They were meant to find traces of the Aryans in Tibet. Himmler imagined them as descendants of a civilization that survived the downfall of Atlantis in the Himalayas. The expedition found that the Tibetan nobility especially showed Aryan elements and was certainly suited to be a partner people to the Germans. Of course, Himmler lived in part in a fantasy world that was dominated by those sorts of Germanic myths and occult topics. But one mustn't overlook the fact that, even with all these private hobbies, he by no means neglected the power political realities he had to deal with as SS Reichsführer. The SS Reichsführer loved to surround himself with willing henchmen. Those included Karl Maria Willigut, an occultist from Austria with supposed psychic abilities. Himmler believed that in Willigut he had found a descendant of an ancient clan in which ancient knowledge had been handed down through the generations. So when he dealt with him and asked him questions, he believed that he was thus able to communicate with the Germanic primeval world. The SS Brigadier General became Himmler's advisor for symbols and ceremonies. Willigut was also able to work as a designer. The notorious skull ring was his creation. He also had the rendering removed from the outer walls of the Wevelsberg in order to make it look more Germanic. But in 1939, Karl Maria Willigut had to leave the SS. He had failed to reveal the fact that he was an escaped patient from an insane asylum. Nonetheless, Himmler continued to maintain a discreet contact with him. The Nazis didn't care so much about demonstrating a development. Rather, they wanted to prove, above all, that history was based on the permanence of races. Investigating the past was meant to prove that there is a superior race in human history. The SS was meant to wage war not only for the state, but for the Aryan race. That included especially fanatical frontline combat units, as well as task forces for killing Jews, and the units assigned to the death camps. What they all had in common was the SS runes. They were a form of identification. In his messages to the front, the leadership of the SS Senior District Southwest 
expressed his enthusiasm for the symbols. It's not for nothing that the sig runes on the black lapels of the Waffen-SS seem so mysterious and yet are so simple to interpret. Victory. Again and again, victory. Soon the double lightning bolts are given their own key on typewriters. The trademark of the supposed Nazi elite is to be typed in a Germanic style, even in official documents. The fact that the symbol of the SS, the double Sieg rune, was made a character on typewriters is unprecedented. The new key was also meant to help make typing more efficient. Since the occupation of areas in the East, the bureaucracy had swelled. The runes of the SS became seen more commonly in Germany. People began to notice that apparently those wearing this label were allowed to do things that a government is normally not allowed to do. And this label was in great demand. It represented power and advantages. There was also an opposite label. And that was the yellow Jewish badge. Those who had to wear that were nothing. They had no power. They were vermin to be eliminated. Victor Klemperer observed the coarsening of German society. He wrote, Today I asked myself again, which was the worst day for the Jews? September 19th, 1941. From that day on, they had to wear the yellow badge. Now that it's been introduced, it doesn't matter anymore if Jewish homes are far apart or form their own neighborhood, because every Jew with a yellow star carries the ghetto with them, like a snail with its shell. Victor Klemperer, son of a rabbi, survived the Nazi regime thanks to the help of his wife, considered Aryan in Nazi parlance. Gauleiter Josef Groe put in a good word for the creator of the SS symbol, graphic artist Walter Heck. Groe asked Himmler for some money for the impoverished designer, arguing that such a deserving comrade should not come away empty-handed. Groe wrote, Despite his plight, Heck did not lay claim to any copyright and agreed to a very small payment. He got two and a half Reichsmarks. It should be taken under consideration whether SS Obersturmführer Walter Heck could not be accorded recognition. SS leader Himmler wanted to show his gratitude. Four months later, he wrote to Walter Heck. Once the war is over, I intend to give you a single family house with a garden as a visible sign of my appreciation. However, I expect you to have already started a family by then, with at least two children. Shortly before that, Himmler had ordered his highest officers to Wewelsburg. He wants to prepare them for what was being called a struggle of annihilation. A few days before the start of the Russia offensive, there was a meeting at Wewelsburg of high-ranking SS leaders who were to be put in the mood, so to speak, for the imminent historic war against the Soviet Union. And that required a certain intimate atmosphere. Later, one of the SS officers would say that Himmler spoke of the decimation of the Slavic race by 30 million. For his speech, Himmler used a hall called the Obergruppenführersaal. Here, around the so-called Black Sun, the race fanatics forged their plans for the Third Reich, as Himmler imagined it. This hall, designed by the SS during the remodeling of the Wewelsburg, today has special significance for neo-Nazis. In its black sun, they see 12 Sieg runes, or three swastikas laid on top of each other. 
graphic designer Andreas Korb studied the symbol extensively. Some see it as a black sun, others simply as a sun wheel. The strength of this symbol is that it leaves a lot of room for interpretations like that. Everyone can see in it what he wants to see. And as with the SS rune itself, the design of the symbol is one thing, but the loading of it with meaning is something else again. Some of Himmler's esoterics believed the black sun produced the light from which the proto-Aryans arose. Others see a connection with the Teutonic Order, with the Nordic Edda saga, or even with King Arthur. Right below the ornament is a hall with a decorated dome. It feels like a crypt. To make it, several floors in the Wevelsburg's North Tower were removed. That kind of work was done by forced laborers from the nearby Niederhagen concentration camp. It's still not clear what the domed hall was meant to be used for. These occult symbols and rituals had great meaning for the SS when you consider the cohesion of the organization and its differentiation from the rest of the world. Himmler's SS provided thousands of perpetrators of the Holocaust. Many of them were motivated to kill by a deep, racist delusion. Hitler was aware of how valuable his loyal Heinrich, as he called him, was. But he was suspicious of his fondness for the supernatural. There are very clear statements from Hitler made in Trusted Company where he considered this, as he called it, occult nonsense, as advocated by Himmler, to be out of the question and thought it was a very unfortunate development. In his culture speech at the party rally, he said decidedly that the Nazi party was not a cult movement but a political movement. At the Nuremberg rally in 1938, Hitler declared that the insinuation into the movement of mystically inclined occult explorers of the beyond must not be tolerated, saying that National Socialism was a cool doctrine of reality. Hitler and the SS began wrestling over interpretational sovereignty. What do the signs of evil really stand for? Back in May 1933, the Nazi regime passed a law protecting national symbols. The Nazis had a great awareness that symbols were hugely important for the cohesion of the organization that must not be allowed to be sentimentalized. That's why there was that early law against the misuse of Nazi symbols. There was a real industry that produced the most outlandish things, and which of course tended to contribute to making those symbols look ridiculous. Christmas tree ornaments with Hitler's face Nazi party boxes and swastika clothing were banned. The party alone was allowed to decide where and when its symbols would be used. The dictator learned from his opponents. In Mein Kampf, he wrote, After the war, I experienced a mass Marxist rally in Berlin, in front of the royal palace and gardens. A sea of red flags, red armbands and red flowers gave this rally, which was attended by about 120,000 people. A tremendous appearance, purely superficially. I myself could sense and understand how easily an ordinary man could succumb to the suggestive allure of such a terrifically potent spectacle. Nazism was supposed to exude a similarly potent allure. Nazi symbols decorated city centers on holidays. The party marketed itself with flags and bunting. Eva Sternberg was a member of the League of German Girls and was thrilled by all the symbols. 
Eine Siegrune, das fand ich sympathisch. Und ich habe das Jungvolk I like the Siegrune. And das I envy the Jungvolk. The parallel organization to the Young Girls League. For boys ages 10 to 14. They had black pennants with a Siegrune on them. And I thought that was great. So I stole a Siegrune pennant and appointed my young girls group with it. But that didn't go down so well with one of my rivals. And I got in trouble. The Nazi signs and symbols seem made for each other, homogeneous, as if they'd been created by an agency. The color code the Nazis used fit very well into their whole ideology. You have the brown, which stands for the militaristic aspect, for the SA and the SS. Then you have black, of course, which was later used for the SS and which exuded an incredible aggressiveness and brutality, especially in connection with the image of the skull. And you have the signal color of red, used along with the swastika, which has a great pithiness and recognizability. It's an ensemble of terror. Nazi propaganda was aggressive. It was accusatory and direct. The blatant, the loud, the openly propagandistic elements certainly helped this regime be very effective and efficient back then. Not least because before this, no one else in politics had used these mass media in such an intense way. So the effect on the population was of course especially intense. But appearances are deceiving. The design of the Nazis, their signs and symbols, were not part of a unified strategy. What unified them was simply their style. Even font choices were ideologically determined. Gothic or Fraktur were all the rage. They were considered Teutonic German fonts. Traditionally, in those folkish circles, there was the notion that the German or Aryan person also had to distinguish himself through a special font. So there was a real cult surrounding these Fraktur typefaces, German typefaces. Official documents were printed in Fraktur, and film posters used the old-fashioned fonts. In 1937, Jewish-owned publishers were forbidden from using Gothic typefaces. Designer Andreas Korb has studied the effect of Fraktur typefaces. Here we have an original poster for a speech by Hitler in 1923, typeset in a Fraktur font, a broken script, and next to it, redesigned. I think you can clearly see here what a great role the typeface plays. A font can almost have a textual influence. I believe the message is clearly rich. It simply has something folkish, populist, not elitist. And if you compare it to this reconstruction of the poster, it's almost like a technical lecture. It has a completely different feel, which does not correspond to that of Hitler. But from 1941, Hitler, along with Martin Bormann, suddenly espoused Roman type. It was an about face, away from the allegedly old Germanic, Bormann issued a circular in which he polemically stated that for him, Fraktur was only made up of Schwabacher Jewish letters, presumably a reference to the fact that Jewish publishers had earlier dealt in books printed with the Schwabach Fraktur typeface. They came from the Fraktur typeface, which of course had a strongly Germanic heritage, and which was meant to demonstrate how important it was to the Nazis to carry on this Germanness and this tradition. Later they switched to a more modern Antiqua font, which was meant to symbolize, we are also a modern progressive and above all global movement. That was the point, expressing the idea to the people out there that the Nazis represented a movement that would eventually conquer the world, which luckily didn't happen. 
Hitler wanted to use the new typeface as an ideological message. In a hundred years, our language will be the European language, he asserted in a speech. And the prerequisite for that was Roman type. It's understandable that Hitler preferred Antiqua. This font, in capital letters, ideally centered along the central axis, is the typographical expression of power. Fraktur typefaces had to disappear from party pamphlets, newspapers and announcements to be replaced by Roman type, the script of the ancient Romans. The entire presence of the Nazis was, of course, completely aimed at preventing any kind of individuality. Essentially, you can say that democracy stands for colorfulness and dictatorships stand for monotony. That has a lot to do with the concept of humanity behind it, meaning that they wanted to bring everyone into line, in the truest sense of the word. With the memory of defeat still fresh, the Nazi regime adheres to its signs of evil. Under their impact, resistance is opposed with deadly rigor. Deserters are hanged, prisoners are executed. Obedience until the bitter end. Many believed to the last in a final victory under the banner of the SS runes. In our memory, they stand for Auschwitz, for a time when there was no room for humanity, at least in Germany. They stand for World War II and for a totalitarian regime that was unique in its ideological power of destruction. And they stand for an entire country and the many people in that country who looked away. After the surrender, hundreds of thousands of people were arrested by the Allies. And suddenly the SS runes were revealing. The symbol of evil identified perpetrators. Sometimes a tattoo indicating a blood group was the key evidence. Often, simply belonging to Himmler's SS was enough for the victors as proof of guilt. Some prisoners were executed immediately. Others were put on trial. For Eva Sternheim, the end of the war meant the end of her world. This scene in the Reichskanzlei that scene in the Reich Chancellery. Above was a big imperial eagle holding a laurel wreath in its talons with a swastika on it. And that was blown up. That still really affects me because that was the downfall. It was all over. The end. Later, she reckoned with her own history and with Germany's. The German title of her book means Was I the only one who cheered? In October of 1945, the Allies passed a law forbidding the Nazi party and all its organizations, including the SS. The newly founded Federal Republic of Germany went one step further, penalizing the use of Nazi symbols. After that massive phase of propaganda, which really did permeate the entire German population, it was important to ban those symbols from public life in order to expedite denazification, just as it was right to ban certain literature, certain statements in order to rebuild democracy. But the fatal attraction has not gone away. The old symbols appear again and again, whether out of ignorance, an assertion of convictions, or as a provocation. The rock band KISS gained notoriety worldwide by using the double lightning bolts, especially when the runes appeared at their concerts in Germany. 
Of course, it leads to real conflicts when a foreign band uses SS runes in its name, and this band sells albums here in Germany or goes on tour here, and then comes into conflict with the peculiarities of German law. When lawyers and fans protested, the band's German record company offered to change Kiss's logo. Shortly thereafter, the label announced in a statement, We would never dream of suspecting the band of glorifying Nazism because of their logo. We are pleased that the band's management has agreed to the change. So Kiss with the double S runes becomes Kiss without them, but only for a short time. The band's singer insists it's not meant to be a Nazi symbol, since he himself is Jewish. An incident from 2015 shows how sensitive many people are to these signs of evil. At Berlin's eternally unfinished new airport, already a public laughing stock, suddenly SS runes appeared on a wall. They can especially be seen online, but rarely on the wall itself. Closer investigation reveals that fixtures for hanging advertising signs were casting compromising shadows under certain lighting conditions. Once you find you have to seriously consider whether there is someone deliberately behind the fact that whenever it's sunny, the main entrance of the airport is covered in these runes due to the way the shadows fall, then you need to take action simply to avoid misunderstanding. Right-wing extremists like to cause provocation using slightly altered symbols. They know exactly what is allowed and what is not. Extremism and racism signaled through slight variations of the old symbols. The inhuman messages of Heinrich Himmler and his henchmen are still behind these tattoos and posters. And the black sun continues to be used. In this country, you are allowed to have and to express extremist views. As painful as that might be, it's a part of our liberty. The line is drawn either where other persons are disparaged or where specifically outlawed organizations are promoted or advertised. And that does not apply to the black sun. The black sun falls through the cracks of German criminal law. It was not the symbol of a Nazi organization, so it has not been banned. Twelve runes which the SS used for their purposes. Back then, as today, signaling right-wing views and a threat to all who believe differently. We Germans are a special case. Germany is more than just the Federal Republic of Germany. And it isn't we who are the wrong way drivers, but everyone else is a wrong way driver. And I'm showing these wrong way drivers. Watch out. Bear in mind what this symbol once meant, and I who now wear it think it is right. I think it is wrong that Hitler was unable to complete the job, and now I'm here to do it. So how should a nation of law deal with this sort of provocation? Can it combat dangerous views with the code of law? Or does it require, above all, courage, conviction and fortitude in order to break the spell of the signs of evil? How watchful must democracy be? We are witnessing how people have no inhibitions to say things about other people that, at best, are insulting and at worst are formulated with the energy of spiritual arson and violence. And we are seeing how this spiritual arson becomes real arson. According to the law, only what is expressed publicly can be penalized. 
It was only when neo-Nazi and MPD politician Marcel Z was photographed shirtless at a swimming pool that he became culpable. His back is tattooed with the slogan from the Buchenwald concentration camp, everyone gets what he deserves. You may indeed have yourself tattooed with Nazi symbols, but you are not allowed to display them publicly. Marcel Zech, who was seen at a swimming pool with a concentration camp tattoo, was convicted of hate speech. Paragraph 130 of the Criminal Code also condemns denying, condoning or making light of the crimes against humanity committed by the Nazis. Marcel Z also lost his case on appeal. In November 2016, he was sentenced to eight months in prison without parole. Many right-wing extremists want a society without tolerance and without solidarity for the marginalized, like back then. They identify themselves through the clothes they wear. A favorite label of many radicals is Tor Steiner. What set the Tor Steiner logo apart was that it combined two runes that were widely known and familiar in Nazi circles. The company's symbol consists of the S rune and the 2 S rune, the Germanic symbol for battle. The label has been taken to court in Germany. Initially, the courts focused on the individual components, the Sieg rune and the Tier rune, and they said both are unconstitutional symbols. The label lost its first case and then won on appeal. When you take different symbols, each of which is actionable on its own, and create a new symbol that has its own optical content that has never been used by a banned organization, then it truly does not have the elements of an offense. Until the court lifted its ban, the company briefly used a new logo. In the meantime, it has returned to the previous two runes. These fashion labels are important for the right-wing camp to project their views outwardly and make themselves identifiable while at the same time strengthening the community inwardly. A small group from the state of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern uses humor to take aim at the right-wing label. Its owners have created the label Storchheiner, Stork Heiner, an entire stork-themed collection with similar designs to those of Tor Steiner. Sales of Storch Heiner products are donated to projects working against right-wing extremists. They're doing exactly that which should distinguish a democratic state. These initiatives work with words on the one hand, but also with the distortion of the original symbols. In doing so, they make fun of the things the other side takes especially seriously and wants to venerate. Torsteiner took the parodists to court and lost. But how should Germany proceed? Some in the country think lifting the ban on Nazi symbols would make them less appealing as a gesture of rebellion. What signal would it send if these were no longer banned? The message would be spread that they were allowed, and if the symbolism were allowed, it would seem that there would no longer be anything questionable about the thoughts and convictions behind them. There are certain symbols that can very easily be exploited. That includes, of course, these symbols from the Nazi era. For some people, they still have a great identification potential. They still have appeal. And that's why it is right to keep these symbols out of the public eye as much as possible, so as not to encourage these people to fall prey to this ideology again. Combating the signs of evil is about more than just a right-wing clothing label or historical details. It's about liberty and the future. 
The ban on using these symbols will surely be maintained for a long time to come. As long as there are still people who suffered under the Nazis, for instance, people whose parents were killed back then, the sensitivity is so great that these symbols will continue to be banned.